Good morning. morning. Welcome to St. David's Episcopal Church on this fifth Sunday after Pentecost. I invite you to stand as you are able and join us in our opening hymn number 410 in the blue hymnal, number 410. Before we continue, uh, just a word about how I'm dressed. I know usually I wear the, um, the chasuble, the sort of large green poncho thingy. Um, it's just not chasuble weather this morning. Um, so later on in the summer, it'll probably be down to just the stole. And if it gets hotter than that, we don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Our service of Holy Eucharist continues in the Book of Common Prayer on page 355. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us pray together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Hear what Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, make us have perpetual love and reverence for your holy name. For you never fail to help and govern those whom you have set upon the sure foundation of your loving kindness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. A reading from the first book of Samuel. David said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and whenever a lion or bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth, and if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, the Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor and he tried in vain to walk for he was not used to them. Then Saul, David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff from in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in his shepherd's bag. In the pouch, his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you can't come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and the wild animals of the earth so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by the sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The response is Psalm 9, verses 9 through 20. Please pray the psalm responsively by whole verse. 
The Lord will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in time of trouble. Sing praise to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Proclaim to the peoples the things he has done. Have pity on me, O Lord. See the misery I suffer from those who hate me. O you who lift me up from the gate of death. The ungodly have fallen into the pit they dug, and into the snare they set is their own foot caught. <clears throat> the, wicked <clears throat> the wicked shall be given over to the grave, and also all the peoples that forget God. Rise up, O Lord, let not the ungodly have the upper hand. Let them be judged before you. A reading from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. As we work together with Christ, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See. Now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute, we are treated as impostors and yet are true as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians, our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children, open wide your hearts also. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord God. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Gospel of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Through my words, O oh God, and in our hearts, teach us to trust. Amen. Please be seated. Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? On some level, that is just a fundamental question of what it means to be a person of faith. Do you care, God? Now, obviously, we all know the answer is yes. I don't want to leave you in suspense. We wouldn't be here if we didn't at least suspect that that was the case that we know that God cares about us, God loves us, we are precious in God's sight, right? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, etc., etc., etc. We know this, but at the same time, that prayer that the disciples offer is fundamental to their faith and to ours. Because there is a really big difference between knowing that God cares for us when we're cozy in a church with the rain pattering on the roof as we, or cozy at home, I hope you're in your pajamas and having a nice cup of coffee. It's very different to know that God cares for us now than when we are outside when the storm is approaching the boat and the water is splashing in. It is a very different thing to know whether or not God cares for us when we find out that our loved one's diagnosis has come back bad. It is a very different thing to know that God cares for us when our child is hurt or sick. It is a very different thing to know that God cares for us when our world feels as though it is falling apart. God, do you care that I am perishing? When we are in the midst of the storm, when we are surrounded by all of the troubles and the evils that this world can throw at us, we can well ask the question, God, do you care? The disciples did so. It made sense. They may well have trusted in Jesus. They knew that he was there. They had seen the things that he could do. They had watched him heal. They had watched him teach these amazing things. And so when they go to the back of the boat to wake him up, it is not an act of faithlessness. It's an act of trust. They're just assuming 
that if Jesus is going to save them from the storm, it would help if he were awake. Which I don't think is that unreasonable, frankly. And yet Jesus chides them. He says, do you still not get it? But he does something even more amazing, of course. And what's truly amazing about it is not just the fact that the sea is calm. It's what happens. Because every time in the Old Testament when a prophet does something like this, there is an interlude with God, right? Moses speaks to God and God says, all right, put your staff in the Red Sea and I'll part it for you. Elijah prays to God to send fire down on his offering. What happens, what the disciples know happens, is that the prophets, these are people who have a direct line to God, essentially. They are the ones who you can go to get it done. But Jesus does not speak to God. He speaks directly to the wind and the waves, and he tells them, peace, be still. And I imagine the effect being something like a ripple, but in reverse, as the calm water spreads out from the boat that they are on to cover the entire sea, and there is a calm as great as the storm. Peace, be still, Jesus says. And it is at this that the disciples are filled not with faith or trust, but with fear. Yes, we had the translation rendered it very religiously and holy as awe. But the word that Mark uses is the same one that gives us phobia, fear. They are filled with a great fear, a fear as great as the storm itself. Because who is this? In whose presence are they standing that the wind and the waves obey him and not God? What is going on here? The trouble, the reason for their fear, I think, is not just that they have seen something incredible that their minds can't quite wrap around, although I'm sure that is part of it. No, the fear is this, that if they know that God cares for them, that Jesus cares that they are perishing because the sea is calm, what did they know when the sea was troubled by storms. If we know that God cares for us, when the diagnosis that we feared is miraculously reversed, when our child is restored to health, when we feel as though we are falling and our feet touch solid ground, if those are signs that God cares for us, then what of the troubles that we face. What do those tell us about God? Is it that the storm is a sign of God's absence, of God's not caring for us? On the one hand, we want this to be the case because it means that we can know at least, what is going on, that if we do the right things, ask the right way, pray the right way, have enough faith, the storm will cease, the winds will quiet, and the waves will flatten. If that is the case, but if that is the case, then the opposite is true, that if the storm continues to rage, then it is not God's fault, but ours. We did not pray the right prayer. We did not have enough faith. We did not do the right thing. We want to treat God kind of like a genie. We want to treat God as, as a black box into which we place our prayers and desires and out of which comes blessing, provided we do it right. That is a God to fear in the old sense of the word. That is a God to be afraid of for a world governed by such a God. 
is not one that is going to lead to our thriving. Because if it depends upon us, we are in trouble. Perhaps, then, the challenge of faith, the difficulty that we are faced with in following Jesus is not following the one who could calm the seas with a word, but following the one who is asleep in the boat. We can worship a God of power very easily. Can we worship a God who sleeps? Can we know and follow a God who is so willing to cast in God's lot with us that God will sleep in the boat with us in the midst of the storm and go with us to life or to death? Can we know a God whose faithfulness is that resolute? A God whose trust in us, whose love for us, will keep us, will not abandon us, will be present with us, whether the storm rages or not. Can we trust a sleeping God? I believe that we can. I believe that this God who is asleep in the boat with the disciples is the same one who is willing to go to the cross for them and for us, who is willing to embrace all of the brokenness of this world to weather every single storm that we have seen or will see, a God who will not abandon us even when the storm overwhelms our boat, a God who is with us no matter what, even when all is lost because this is a God who is with us to death and beyond. That is someone worth trusting. That is a God who is worthy of our faith, a God who acts, who loves, who is present, not because of our goodness, of our prayers, of our right actions, of our right thoughts, but simply because of who God is. The God we know in Jesus Christ is one who loves us, who will never let us go, who will wrap us in arms of love like a mother and cradle us to sleep as the boat is rocked by the storms of life. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able and join with the voices of the church in every time and place as we affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, beginning on page 358. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, 
who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are form three, beginning on page 387 in the Book of Common Prayer, 387. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. Remembering especially Michael, our presiding bishop, Thomas, our own bishop, Shannon and Rob, our assisting bishops, and Andrew, Sarah, Chris, and Gail, our clergy, we pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. Remembering especially Joseph, our president, and Janet, our governor, we pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find favor in your sight. Remembering especially those in our parish who have asked for our prayers, especially Sue Andrews, Maureen Summers, Michelle Mondor, Dorothy Matheson, Sue Currier, Carolyn Kershaw, Nancy Tuttle, Louise McCormick, Pat Gagne, Ann Becker, Ellen Tacey, Ezra, Cindy Anderson, Sue Cryer, Bernie and Nancy Carson, Polly Gosselin, Asher Elliston, Pat Musser, Julie McClinchy, Suzanne Robinson, Steve and Julia Smith, Mike Costello, and our family and friends whose names are listed in the bulletin. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress. Remembering especially those who have died Gerard Labbey and Dick Clinton, in whose memory the vigil candle is lit. Give to the departed eternal rest, that light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. I invite your prayers, either silently or aloud. We pray for those delegates and bishops who are gathered this week in Louisville for the Episcopal Church's General Convention, particularly for the House of Bishops as they elect a new presiding bishop. O oh Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O oh lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Turning to page 360, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. 
Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And now, friends, the peace of Christ be always with you. Let's share with one another some sign of God's peace. God's peace to all those of you watching at home. Morning, everybody. Morning. We've got a great day today, rain and shine, whatever we have. We have a picnic, so please stay and join us for a picnic after the service today. And sorry for people that are away, but we'll think of you. <laughs> so a um, couple of announcements that are pretty important. Um, well, they're always important. Um, we can hard to believe, but we need to think about Christmas. So um, we did get a wonderful message in the announcements about um, caring unlimited and Christmas time. So please read that one carefully because there's so many wonderful ways in which you can donate to that particular program and it's so needed. Um, we've got a, a textile drive and this is another great thing because you know you say, well, I can't give that to St. Elizabeth's and I can't give that to the budget box because it's not very good stuff. Well, there's still a place for it. There's recycling, and we love recycling, and we love to be able to take those old blankets and old stuff that, that's clean and bring it to the church, and the, you can actually bring your donations. There's two places. You can bring it over to Quest, the fitness center over in Kennebunk, or you can bring it here. And if any of you are familiar with where we keep our books, um, we store our books for the books, that's where you can bring your things. So just bring them clean. Um, but these are your old stuff that you don't want to just throw away. So just bring them here and we will, um, June and Roy will be involved with, with this drive and they will uh, take this materials away and it will be recycled, not just thrown in, in a dumpster somewhere and, and uh, in a landfill kind of thing. So we don't want to do that. The other thing I want to mention just, and um, it's important, and you might see these out yeah, um, in the church. They're, they're over there, the Adeline Root. You know, some of us need to most of us need to restore in the summer. And there's this beautiful retreat center open to women and men, and it's right down in Byfield, Massachusetts, so not very far. And you want to maybe take a look at this brochure. There's a lot of good programs for the summer. You can just go for the day. Um, beautiful grounds, beautiful places to pray, wonderful labyrinth if you like to walk and those kinds of things. So I really recommend that. And the last thing I'm going to mention, because they're always worth mentioning, is hands across our community. Please give donations to this. This makes all the difference for our food pantry this is, and, other, and other services that we provide to the community. And um, that's my announcements. Does anybody else have any announcements? Mary Jane. I didn't tell anyone I was doing this, but um, I love St. David's. I'm a retired United Methodist clergy person. Um, I live down in the, uh, the Methodist kibbutz, as our district superintendent once called it. I sit here every Sunday with some of my retired Methodist colleagues. However, um, my district superintendent has asked me if I would take a church. We don't, we don't go out and look for churches. Um, we don't get hired, we get sent and appointed. And I have said yes. I have accepted um, a quarter time position at the West Baldwin United Methodist Church. What this means is you won't see me sitting there with, with uh, fellow Methapalians every Sunday. I made it a condition that I will have one Sunday a month off so I can come here uh, to, the, to the later service. But thank goodness I can also go to the early 8 o'clock service every week, so I'll get to know some of you 8 o'clockers like 
like five there. Um, so I'm, I'm, I have very mixed feelings. I'm going to miss Andrew's sermons. Um, I'll have to p create my own. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, take notes, exactly. <laughs> you never know. Um, and I will also continue to be part of the Wednesday morning uh, Eucharist and healing service. So I haven't given up on you. I love you all. I love St. David's, and I will be ministering um, out of some of the, the strength and love that I experience here. So I just wanted to let you know that. For those of you who maybe aren't as familiar, Mary Jane is also the head of our earthkeeping ministry, and so you've heard her talk about many things related to our environmental stewardship. Do you have another thing? Absolutely. So just because she's not here doesn't mean she's not still working, which is always great. Um, now is a time that we're taking during the summer season to um, offer just a little bit of insight, hopefully, into our liturgy. Um, and we're calling these liturgy moments. There is a box in the back of the church. If you've got questions, feel free to uh, write them down on a slip there, and that'll help me to um, think of something to say at this time. Um, I, last week, someone asked a, a really interesting question about the prayers of the people. And I wanted to point out, one sec, if you look on page 383 in the Book of Common Prayer, yeah, you didn't realize this was going to be like school, did you? Um, there is, that's sort of where the, the different forms that we use here at 8 o'clock, at 10.30, 9.30, whatever time it is, uh, that's where those different forms start. And essentially, the prayers of the people is a time when, as I explained last week, we respond to the Word of God in prayer. And the way we do that in the Episcopal Church is we always offer uh, in, intentional prayer for six kind of categories, for the church, for our nation and all those in authority, for the world, for our local community, for any who suffer, and for the departed. And so if you notice, whenever we do use different forms for the prayers of the people, but you'll notice that those six elements are always somewhere in there. And the other interesting thing about the prayers of the people is that while there are these six particular forms that we use and rotate through, um, there's actually nothing that says we have to only use those. And so there are options, you'll know certainly in different seasons of the year, we'll use different forms or tweak them, adjust them. Really, this is the part of our liturgy that has the most kind of freedom to it in terms of what we can and, and do use. The goal of this part of the service is not to, for us to say all the right words and check off all the right boxes, but rather the goal is for us to be together in a spirit of prayer. And so that sometimes looks like one of these forms, sometimes it looks like something completely different. And so I would urge you, if you're ever interested in being a part of how uh, these prayers come together, if you're, you're certainly if you're interested in helping to write prayers of the people, I'd be more than happy to talk with you about that because it is a wonderful and meaningful way for us to gather in prayer. And it's something that while we have tremendous gifts in our prayer book, they are not the only things that we can use as we gather together in a spirit of prayer. So that's our liturgy moment for today, um, and if you are have any other questions, feel free to put them in the box in the back. Now, the last and most important thing I can think of to share with you is a reminder that each and every one of you who seeks a closer relationship with Christ is welcome to receive communion at this table. When the time comes, I invite you to come forward to the altar rail as the, as the ushers direct you. You hold out both hands to receive the bread. If you need a gluten-free wafer, hold out one hand instead of two, and I'll know to give that to you. And as the chalice bearer comes around with a chalice, you can either help them guide it to your lips, or if you're not comfortable with that, you can touch your wafer to the outside of the chalice or simply cross your arms over your chest as a sign that you are still fully participating in this sacrament, whether or not you receive the bread and the wine. And if for whatever reason you're not disposed to receive communion here today at all, know that this time is for you and you are a part of us. So if that's the case, I invite you to come forward with your arms crossed over your chest uh, as I come by, and I'll know to give you a blessing rather than communion. And now let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice unto God.
Bless, O Lord, these offerings for the work of your holy church. Amen. Our service of Holy Eucharist continues with Eucharistic Prayer B, beginning on page 367. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death. We proclaim his resurrection. We await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things under the care of your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with blessed David, our patron, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your children. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
prayer after communion is found on page 365. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, remember that life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father who created you, the Son who redeems you, and the Holy Spirit who makes you holy, be among you today and remain with you always. Amen. Can we trust a sleeping God? Yes, God is with us all the time when the seas are calm and when the wind is whipping and the sea is rough, God is with us. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia.
the church. Yeah. Okay, I will put it in the in with the envelope. Thank you so much.